Hello, welcome along. It's another episode of Writer's Routine. This is the place where we investigate the working day of some of the biggest authors around. This week, we're chatting to one of the UK's best-selling crime writers, Ian Rankin. Uh, He's just published his 22nd Rebus novel. It's called In a House of Lies, and he'll tell us where, why, and how he managed to get his story down. Also, how he's almost as surprised by the killer is as all of his readers, and we find out how his writing style has changed over 30 years. Say in the first Rebus book, I think it's wildly overwritten. I was a young man who wanted to show off how much he knew about words and stuff. A lot of puns, a lot of wordplay. The whole crime is solved because of wordplay and puns. Um, the, the name Rebus means picture puzzle, and that's what's being sent to him in the first book is picture puzzle. So that in itself is a, is a, is a joke or a pun. So stay there. Another writer's routine is on the way. Yes, hello, my name is Dan Simpson, welcome along, thank you so much for giving Writer's Routine a listen. Our guest sharing his Writer's Routine this week is the crime writing phenomenon, Ian Rankin. So excited to have him on, when I first had the idea for the show, he was one of the first names that I put for authors that I really wanted to chat to about their day. Uh, He's one of the UK's best-selling and biggest crime authors. He's written 22 novels about Detective John Rebus, loads more short stories as well. There have been Rebus TV shows, radio plays. He's one of those characters that transcend the story and almost become a cultural icon. And he's back again in In a House of Lies. And we'll talk to Ian about the first idea that he had for the story and how it took a brainwave on a Caribbean beach to make him get it down on paper. Uh, Also, unlike many characters in stories, Rebus, he ages with Edinburgh. It all happens in real time. So we'll chat about how that has both helped and hindered Ian's writing. Uh, And we'll talk about who he actually works on his stories for. For the readers or just for himself? Also, uh, stick around, you can hear about a massive prize that your writing can win in just a sec. It can really help get your book out there. I'll give you all the details in a little bit. First, let's get into it then. This week's Writer's Routine with Ian Rankin. And we start, as always, with what he sees around him in the place where he sits down to write. Ah, well, that's a much more complicated question than you might think because I write in different places. Uh, Mostly I would write in Edinburgh, uh, in my house. One of the spare bedrooms has been turned into my office and when I look around me, there's just tons and tons of stuff. CDs, LPs, there's a sound system, there's a desk full of mail and bills waiting to be paid. There's posters and pictures on the walls. There's a sofa that I can sit on and a coffee table. And then there's my writing desk, which is a desk I've had for... Now, I'm going to... Let me think. bought it in Tottenham Court Road in 1986 when I got married. And we schlepped it from Tottenham Court Road back up to Tottenham where we had a flat and on the, on the, on the underground. And it's just one big slab of wood and then two kind of trestles. And it's gone with me from London to France... France back to Edinburgh. It's been in several houses in Edinburgh, and it's my lucky desk. I would never get rid of it. I would never consider uh, not having that desk in my home. Any pictures on the walls? There's some paintings. I've got some artists I like. Um, uh, John Bellany is one of my favourites. He does these kind of coastal scenes. There's a framed big blow-up photograph of the Rolling Stones signed by the guy who, who took the photo. Uh, I think there's a photograph of me when I met Muriel Spark, the only time I ever met her, one of my favourite authors. Uh, there's bits and pieces, some post-it notes. If I'm in the middle of a book, there'll be post-it notes. If I'm not, the post-it notes will all have gone. But that's one room. But I also write up in Cromarty, which is a little fishing village in the north of Scotland. We've got a house up there. And to start a book, I'd normally go up there because there's no... The phone doesn't ring. There's no cell phone signal. Uh, there's no TV, no distractions, nobody knows I'm there. I just sit with my laptop, plug it in and start writing. And I get good days and bad days, but a lot of days are good. And I can break the back of a first draft in a couple of weeks. Well, let's get into it then. The show's called Writer's Routine. Tell me about yours. The moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed on a day when you're writing, leave no like dull, <coughs> tedious stone unturned for uh, me. Well, there's plenty of dull, tedious stones. I mean, the first thing when I wake up is I go and get coffee. Uh, and the paper, and then I read the paper cover to cover, then I do the Sudoku, killer Sudoku, then I do the kind of polygon, the kind of word puzzle, then I do the cryptic crossword, 
then I take a break, then I check my emails, and then eventually I think, oh, I better start writing. So by about 11 o'clock, I'm probably starting to write. Uh, now, on a good day, I'll write straight through. I'll just, I won't even break for lunch. If I do break for lunch, it'll be a cup of soup. You know, it'll just be some soup heated up in a microwave. Um, if I need a break, I'll go for a walk. Um, if I'm in Cromarty, that walk will be along the seafront. I might go back to the cafe and have another coffee. I might go to the pub and have half a pint of beer. Go back to the house and start again and just keep writing through until 6 or 7 o'clock and then break for dinner. And on a really good day, I'll go back after dinner. Now, some days aren't good. Some days you sit down at the computer and you think, I've got nothing. Nothing's coming. I'm having to force the words out. It doesn't feel natural. It's not flowing. It's stuttering. No. Walk away. I'll walk away and I'll just do something else. I'll read a book. I'll do. I'll go for a walk. I'll just do anything but think about the book. And a good day can start at 8 p.m. at night. So, you know, you sit down at 8 and think, I'll give it one last go. Oh, hang on a minute. Maybe this is what should be happening. And the writing starts to flow and you find yourself midnight, one in the morning, you've done a solid day's work, but you've not started till late at night. On days when you are starting to write at eight in the evening, will you ever temper yourself at all? If it is pushing 2am now and you're cracking through it, will you think, well, I might need to go to bed at some point or do you just, if it's coming, let it go? When I was a young man full of vim and vigour, I would just keep going, you know. But now if I do that, if I write into the night, the next morning I'm shattered. It takes me a while to recover. So I would rather just say, no, I'm going to stop about 8 o'clock, I'll stop, or 9 o'clock. On a, on a, you know, if, I've, if I've been going all day, I'll stop and, and not go and do a, another session. Whereas when I was young, I'd think, oh, I'll do a late night session on top of the daytime session. The thing is, when I was young, I was having to write two books a year just to survive, just to make enough money to live on. So I was having to really push the words out. And having trained as a journalist, I could do that. You know, I thought nothing of doing, let me think, what would, I, I mean, even now a decent day, a good day would be three to three and a half thousand words a day, every day. And I'm talking seven days a week. So that's 20,000 words a week, which means in five weeks, you've got a hundred thousand word novel. Do you ever take a day off? Not if I'm working. No, because I'll start to forget stuff because it's not, I don't have many notes at the beginning. And a crime novel is very complex. It's very interconnected, interlocked pieces. If I take a day off, I'll forget what's going on. I'll forget, I'll come back to the work face and look at the screen and go, oh, hang on a minute, where did I go from here? Um, and I'll forget connections between people, I'll forget stuff that I've got to put in, red herrings that I need to add, subplots or where they're going. Um, and because I've not taken a lot of notes, a lot of structural notes before I start writing, uh, the first draft is me actually doing that. It's me creating a skeleton on top of which I'm going to put some meat later on. So it's kind of, it's the, kind of the, the, the spine of the story. Does it work? Does it stand up? Um, and I know as little as my cop. So when my cop starts and there's a murder or there's a body, I don't know who done it. I have no idea who done it when I start the book. And the first draft is me getting to know the characters and how they might relate to this and who might have done it and why they might have done it. And the story tells me what. The t story gives me the answers as I go through it. There's no elevator pitch. I can't do that. I don't give my publishers anything. They don't get a synopsis. Or I can't do synopses. I don't do it. I just start writing. And, and when the book's finished, I know what the story was. I don't know what the story was till I've written the book. But this one in particular, I was on holiday with my wife in January, and I was panicking like hell because I knew I had to deliver a book by the end of June. And it was January. I had nothing. Um, so we were away, and it was nice. It was in the Caribbean. It was lovely. And uh, every day I would just sit and stare into space and go, well, maybe maybe this happens and maybe that happens. And I've got a little file that I keep of clippings, newspapers, magazines, scribbled, scribbled notes on bits of paper, anecdotes people have told me, possible character names. And I go through that, sift through it. And something struck me. And it was something I'd cut out of Private Eye magazine. And it was a story of a, the, the murder, unsolved murder of a Private Eye in the south of England from way back in the day. And I thought, oh, I've, I, a private eye is an, int an intriguing character, and I've not done anything with a private eye in the books before. Um, so that gave me the starting point. That was all I needed. That was the start. And and I thought, well, what, what, you know, has he turned up in the present day? Yes, he has. Is he dead? Yes, he is. Was he killed a long time ago? Yes. Who finds him? Some kids. Boom, that's my opening scene. Who killed him? No idea. Why did he die? Don't know. What was he looking into? Um, links between uh, uh, organized crime and big business. Um, okay, so now we've got some suspects. Now, originally, uh, he was killed 10 years ago, so there was obviously a missing persons case back in the day. Was that carried out properly, or was maybe some were, were things covered up? Oh, hang on a minute, Rebus was the cop who was involved in the missing persons case. So now in the present day, him and his team are going to be investigated 
for corruption because maybe they were hiding stuff or why didn't they find the body? Was there malfeasance? Was they didn't do their job properly? So that's constructing the house of lies. And the house of lies is all the lies that were told back then about what was actually going on in the, in the inquiry. So at that point, you're asking yourself a lot of questions. Totally. When do, when do they start to get answered? Uh, sometimes in the second draft. Sometimes not until the second draft. So there was one book I wrote, The Hanging Garden. I had no idea who the killer was even when I finished the first draft. <laughs> it was just a big gap. I just What I'll do is during the first draft, I'll just type up little notes to myself saying, oh, hang on a minute, he might be the guy who was in the hotel. So go back to the beginning and make it so. you know. Or hang on a minute, she might be the person who saw him that night. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of just feeling my way towards what the actual structure of the story is and how it all fits together. And I go back in the second draft and tidy all that up so it looks like it was always meant to be. And I don't do much in the way of research before I start writing the book. The research gets done after the first draft. And that speeds up the process miraculously because... I mean, there were times back in the past I wrote a book <clears throat> that had a <clears throat> um, serial, no, not a serial killer, a hitman, an assassin, but he had haemophilia. And I spent months researching haemophilia, and it turned out all I needed was a couple of sentences. You know, now I would write the book and look back at the first draft and go, okay, what do I need to know? Not what, do, what might I need to know, but what do I really need to know? And then I'll go and do the research. So that speeds up that process a lot. So the research gets done between first draft and second draft. Um, the first draft is so... I won't show it to anybody. I wouldn't show it to my publisher. I wouldn't show it to my wife. I'm the only person who sees my first drafts and sees how bad they are. Is, is it 22 books? I think it's of, 22 Rebus novels, yeah. yeah. Have you got better at keeping a hold of the thread <clears throat> that you are... You, you know, the, the, the different things that you're... The different plates that you're spinning? Have you, have you got a system so, so you know what's happening with the story so that you don't need to ever drop one of them? Have you got piles of notes spread all around you? Um, I mean, the notes do accumulate as the as the draft goes on, um, post-it notes and things, little notes to myself in the margins, because I do print out every day. I think when you read stuff when it's printed, you see things you don't see on a screen. So I tend to print out and read. But you know what? I don't read that much. I don't, you know, when I'm writing, what I'll do is when I see when I end the day, if I'm writing the first draft, I end the day, I'll say, OK, I'm about to finish for the day. This is what happens next in the next scene, the next chapter. And I'll leave it at that. Um, so when I go back in the morning and look at that, I'll go, OK, right, so I go there and do this now. Um, but I don't go back and read what I've written the previous day. And so characters change names. You know, somebody will, have, will be, I'll eventually be called Joe Bloggs because I can't remember what I called him. And I'll fix that in a second draft. Somebody's got a moustache on page five and a full beard by page 30, you know, and I'll fix that in the, in the second draft. I won't go back and check because that just slows everything down. It slows the process down. When I'm writing, I'm a, I'm a machine, I'm a demon. I just want to get these words down in the page. And I think writing it quickly injects pace into the narrative and makes it a quick read so as well as you know writing it quickly means i don't forget all the stuff i need to all these plates i keep spinning because i'm writing it quick quickly there's less chance of me forgetting them and it's not hugely structured i mean i know writers who do two 300 page synopses before they start writing a book i mean james elroy famously does a 300 page synopsis um i, I don't do any so i don't do anything i've got a few scribbled notes and i just start and i think well where am i going now and my wife says there's a problem come about page 55 or 60 the problem is if you especially doing a crime novel you've got the crime you start with the crime you've got a cast of characters who are assembled who are going to try and solve it they will go and interview friends family who's the victim um where were they let's look at the cctv let's look at their private life let's look at their phone records let's build up a picture of who this person is let's have the let's go to the mortuary let's have the autopsy what does that show us etc etc Having done that, you're at about page 55, 60. And you better hope by then that you've got some threads that you want to follow because it might end up that you've got nothing. And my wife says, I usually come downstairs, sit at dinner and go, I don't know where I'm going next. Or I phone her up from Cromarty and I say, I don't know where I'm going next. I've got to the end of that bit. Um, but when I go back and think, I go, well, hang on a minute. He worked for that guy and that guy was a bit dodgy. So maybe that guy knew her and maybe she was a person who got him into that. And you do start to, the story tells you where it wants to. It sounds crazy. But the story tells me where I should go next, and I just follow it. And uh, there's been times where I've thought, this is a great character, he's going to be around for a while, oh no, he's dead. Because the, the novel says you don't need this guy, bump him off. And that happened in a book called, I think it was Set in Darkness, uh, and I thought this guy was going to be in the next three books. He was an MSP, a member of the Scottish Parliament. I thought he's going to be in my next three books. No, he was dead by page 50 of the first book. So that was that. No idea who killed him, just another body that I've got to try and somehow explain.
Um, and the novel says this is what you need. You know, you, you don't need him, you need her. This minor character is actually going to be a major character. This person you thought was a major character is actually a minor character. This subplot that you thought was just there to get Rebus to Glasgow is actually crucially important to the whole, etc., etc. And I don't know it until I stumble across it. I'd quite like to investigate how your writing routine and process has changed across 22 Rebus books. So if you go back to the first one, which would have been Knots and Crosses... Yeah. How much do you remember about writing that story? So do you remember the very first moment that the idea which became Knots and Crosses came into your mind? Yeah, and I, do, I, I, know it, I know it intimately because I kept the notes from that night. I was a student at Edinburgh University. I was a postgraduate student. And I just got a book deal for my first book, The Flood, which wasn't a crime story. And I was, I think it was literally the same day I'd gone into the, and signed the contract for it. <clears throat> and I went back to my student flat, sat in the living room, and this notion popped into my head of a guy who's being tormented by these little messages being sent to him that should mean something to him, but he doesn't know what. And I wrote down, so I started writing that down, guys getting sent messages, cryptic messages. He may be a cop. That was it. That was the start. And uh, and, and eventually, as still as a student, um, started plotting it out but I was a student so I had other stuff I, should, I needed to be doing and that was the case for the first few books I was either a student or I was working in London working as a journalist working at Middlesex Polytechnic as a secretary the novels were having to be conceived and written in the margins of my daily life so it was it was mornings evenings and weekends and so you had to be really blinkered in your approach because you had to get through it because you only had so many hours in a day to, to write these books Fortunately, the books weren't very long back then. <laughs> novels weren't very long back in those days. I mean, the first Rebus novel was about 160 pages. I remember thinking at the time, I can't imagine ever writing a book over 200 pages. Can't imagine it. And now crime novels are routinely five, 600 pages. Not mine. Mine are getting thinner again. They did get fat for a while, but they're getting slimmer again. Why do you think that is? Why are my books getting slimmer? Yeah. I think because I'm always afraid I'm going to drop dead before I finish writing <laughs> it. Uh, now, you know what? I think books are just getting too fat. I mean, it's just a general point. I think that, is it because editors don't have the heft they used to have? Writers do it because they can. It's so much, It's so easy with a computer just to keep writing. So do you think that's a conscious decision on, on your part then? You're self-editing to such an extent that you're coming closer to 200 words uh, pages rather than three. I think 350 is a good length for a crime novel. I mean, there was this, there was a kind of uh, feeling back in the 80s and early 90s when I was starting out that if your book was 200 pages or under, which a lot of crime fiction was back then, it was just a who done it. If your book was more than 300 pages, it was a who done it, but it was something more. It was a state of the nation novel. It was a nation. It was a novel of character. Um, it was striving towards literary fiction, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of crime writers went, oh, so this is the secret, is to make your book a bit longer. And we started padding. We started padding books out. And, and I see it now. I see a lot of books and I think, well, that's too much detail or this is a, this is a road we don't need to go down or um, this is too casual, it's too leisurely. And I just like to get in and out. I like to get in and out as a reader and I like to get in and out as an author. I like to get it written fast. I like to get it read fast. It's interesting there when earlier on, uh, today, you mentioned the book, to, to the story to some extent controls you, controls how you're writing it, yet you're still you're still exerting the control over how long you're going to let it be. Um, aside from your stories becoming bigger and then shorter, in 22 books, what else do you think has changed about the way that you write? Um, well, I mean, the, the, the process probably hasn't changed that much, but I started off in a portable typewriter, went to an electric typewriter, went to an Amstrad computer, went to a, a big, you know, chunky, clunky computer PC, and now I'm down to a laptop and I wouldn't change it. Uh, that's what I write on now. I write all the books on a, on a laptop. Very portable, so I can take it on holiday with me. I can take it up to Cromarty with me. Um, it's, it's, it makes it a lot easier. Um, but I still love paper, so I still will print out and, and read the first draft and, and actually ch make changes in the margins and stuff. So the mindset hasn't changed, I don't think. The means of production have maybe changed, but the mindset hasn't changed. I mean, I'm still the same person I was when I wrote the first book. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm living in slightly more lavish circumstances. I'm not sitting in my student digs in a kind of bed sit, typing away in a typewriter. Um, I can, if I want, I can take a Caribbean holiday and start my books there. Um, I've got that, that privilege now that I never used to have. But the Ian who sits down to write these books is still the same Ian who sat scribbling stories on bits of paper in his bedroom when he was a teenager. 
you know, writing poems to girls who couldn't talk to in the playground, uh, writing song lyrics for bands that never existed, uh, writing short stories based on novels that I'd read and loved, and, you know, using creative writing uh, as a means of escaping the slightly boring everyday existence. I was a, a student of literature. I was doing a PhD on Muriel Spark, and uh, she was influenced heavily by Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote Jekyll and Hyde. And I wanted to show that Edinburgh in the present day, as it was then, was still a Jekyll and Hyde city, a city of people with a lot and people who had nothing, a city that looked looked elegant and cultured on the outside, but underneath there was a lot of terrible stuff happening. And the biggest problem with uh, uh, heroin in Western Europe per capita at that time, which Irvin Welsh would eventually talk about in Trainspotting, uh, problems with homelessness and prostitution and various other things. But they weren't on the surface, they were just below the surface. I would say, well, here's this Jekyll and Hyde city, a city that structurally is a Jekyll and Hyde city as well, the new town, the old town, the rational town, and the kind of higgly-piggly town that had no planning at all. So I just thought, this is perfect. Edinburgh's a perfect place for crime fiction. And also, having not grown up there, I wanted to explore Edinburgh. I wanted to make sense of the place. And I thought, how am I going to do that? I'm going to write novels about it. So having written two or three or four, I thought, well, A, Rebus is a really good guide for me around this place, my character. Uh, and B, I just want to keep exploring it because there's more to explore. There's more in its history. There's stuff happening. Changes are taking place. Scottish Parliament's arriving. Devolution. Um, all kinds of changes are happening. The rise and fall of the Royal Bank of Scotland as a, as a banking behemoth. Social change, of course, gentrification, Leith, train spot and Leith suddenly become trendy Leith, where you go for your Michelin starred restaurants. I want to encompass all of that. And, and Edinburgh's organic, it keeps changing, so I keep finding new material and new things I want to tell people about and share with them. And the lovely thing is that because it's a real city, and I make it as real as possible in the books, Rebus drinks in a real bar, he works in real police stations, he lives in a real street, readers come from all over the, over the world and find Rebus's Edinburgh. They find it isn't a very fictional construct. It's a it's a real place, a real f flesh and blood pr place as much as I can make it. And that's really exciting to me that readers come there and go, oh, my God, flesh market close. That's a real place. It's not just the name of one of your books. And, and oh, my God, the Oxford Bar is real. And, and is Rebus going to be there when I go inside? No, is the answer. But the, but the, but the, the, you know, the, 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 the fallacy is there. I just love it. But, uh, and it's also in real time. Yeah, more or less in real time, which is problematic. I mean, I made that decision early on. That how can I write about changes taking place in society if my character doesn't age and change? So I thought, okay, he's going to... Ne never thinking that he would still be around in his late 60s, you know, having invented them in 84, 85. First book was published in 87. Um, it, okay, he might be around for 10 years, might be around for 20 years. Oh, my God, he's been around for 30 years and he's still going. So there's, there's a problem coming, you know, soon. There's a big problem coming. A big big uh, question for me is how, you know, when do you draw the line and say, that's it, there's no more books with him because he, he, he realistically can't be a detective anymore. He's retired. I mean, he's, and he's, his health is not what it was and all the rest of it. But Conan it was, Doyle managed it? Well, Conan Doyle brought Holmes back for a wee while because the money was good. Mm. Um, I brought Rebus back because I got an idea for a plot that needed a retired cop, really, to be in it. And I thought, I've already got one of those, so I might as well use him. Uh, I, you know, but I, I can imagine a time when I'm going to say, no, there's no... N realistically, he can't be doing this. He can't be in an old folks' home. Him and Cafferty, the gangster who runs Edinburgh, are both in an old folks' home, whizzing around in their electric wheelchairs, trying to, trying to kill each other. How much do you think about... I mean, it's hard to ask this question now because obviously you're so many books in, but how much do you think about the voice that you're using to tell your stories? So the voice, the tone, the, the simple which word is coming next in a sentence. How, yeah, how much do you consider that? I think that's changed. Again, I think it's changed. I think, in the, say, in the first Rebus book, I think it's wildly overwritten. I was a young man who wanted to show off how much he knew about words and stuff. A lot of puns, a lot of wordplay. The whole crime is solved because of wordplay and puns. Um, the, the name Rebus means picture puzzle. And that's what's being sent to him in the first book is picture puzzle. So that in itself is a, is a, is a joke or a pun. Um, then the books got a bit leaner and meaner um, as I started to get a bit more confident about crime fiction per se and then the books got longer and more complex, the plotting got more complex I learned a lot from James Elroy, I loved his books so much that the books, the Rebus books started to learn, take stuff from him so for example, Elroy uses a lot of slang in his books, a lot of slangy stuff and you might not automatically know what these words mean but hopefully the context gives you a sense. And Black and Blue, the first really successful Rebus book, uh, 
owed a lot to that. I used a lot of slang in that, very pun- punchy short sentences, very punchy staccato uh, chapters. Uh, and also because I was more confident as a writer, I took Rebus out of Edinburgh, I took him up to Shetland, I took him to Glasgow. So geographically it was a much bigger book, physically it was a much bigger book, and it was a more complex book. Um, and the book stayed like that for a while, and then I started to simplify them again. Um, I felt, though I've, in fact, I'll tell you what I did. I reread a book called Dead Souls, which I think is the longest Rebus novel. And I couldn't make sense of it when I read it. I just thought, and this was, you know, quite a few years after I'd written it. I thought, what's go- I don't understand. It's too complicated. It's too, too complicated. So I'm trying to make the books more simple, but the book doesn't always work out that way. You know, someone just reviewed the new book and said, oh, it's a huge cast of characters and you've got to be on your toes to remember how people connect. I'm going, well, I thought it was writing a really straightforward book <laughs> where it would be quite straightforward to remember how all these characters interconnected. So I've done it again. I've, done it, I've made the book too complex again. How keenly in your mind are you keeping y- your reader? Uh, I was chatting to actually Simon Mayo about his stories and he says he said that he primarily writes for himself. Now yeah. it must be quite tough for you. Oh, every every bloody author says that. None of them mean it. It must be quite tough, <laughs> as you say, when you've written what twenty two Rebus books now. When Re- when Rebus is this, I don't want to say it again, but this institution, this mm. this crime and thriller fiction institution. How much are you thinking about the the reader that's going yeah. to be sat there? I mean, you try not to think too much about it, but there are certain things you do think. You think, okay, wait a minute, do do I need to explain this world for new readers? A new reader's coming along, are they going to be scared off by the fact that they, they feel they need to have read the first 21 books? So you try and make it as, as approachable and as accessible as possible. Don't refer back too much to stuff that's happened in the past. At the same time, you've got these continuing characters, and you do need to give a little bit of their backstory and how they connect to each other to help the new reader without boring readers who've been with you since day one. So it is a, a balancing act, and you just learn how to do it. Or think, or you know what? You trust the reader. I trust the reader. I just thought that you don't have to give them too much information. They'll work it out. Readers are intelligent people. That's why they're readers. So just trust them to work it out, how these people connect to each other. So what does a Reba story need to be then? Well, I, I, you know, again, I mean, the publisher and a lot of readers would like each book to be different from the previous book, but very similar. Similar in feel. So, you know, there's not a disjunction. It isn't suddenly set in the past. It isn't suddenly gone to the first person. It isn't suddenly a cookery book. I've not suddenly written Rebus's cookery book or the Rebus children's book. Um, it's a recognisable world and a world that they enjoy spending time in. So I'm, I'm conscious of that. At the same time, the book's got to satisfy me. I don't want to feel that I'm just going through the usual hoops. So I keep. that's why Rebus, Rebus living in real time has been a real bonus to me. And the fact that he's left the police force has been a bonus to me because that keeps me on my toes. I go, well, oh, hang on a minute. How can I get him into a police investigation? How does he get into a, How does he inveigle his way into a police inquiry when he's just a civilian? Um, he's got these issues now with his health that he never had in the earlier books. So I've got to go, OK, can he do this? Could he get in a fight? Is he afraid of getting in a fight? Oh, right. So the Rebus, who was in his 40s and relished the chance to have a physical confrontation, is not the Rebus I'm writing about now. Rebus I'm writing about now is afraid of physical confrontation because he would probably lose and that would be shaming to him. So he tries to avoid it at all costs. So all this stuff is taken on board and it makes every new book feel to me like a standalone. Do you like him? I think I like him more than he likes me. <laughs> I, I really don't. I've, if we met in the Oxford bar, we could what? We could talk about music for a wee bit. We could talk about Edinburgh for a wee bit. And then we'd have to go our separate ways because he would see me as being a wishy-washy liberal who's never had to do a hard day's work in his life, you know. Um, he left school at 15. There were no job prospects, so he joined the army. The army basically broke him, eventually picked himself back up again and joined the police and worked his way up to being a detective inspector. His life experiences are nothing like my life experiences. You know, I went through high school, got good grades, so immediately got a university education, first member of my family got to uni. Back then in the late 70s, you got everything paid for. You got you got money to go to uni. You got paid to go to uni, and you got all your fees paid and everything. I got it easy. I got it. I got it so much easier than than people in this generation. And I became a writer because I wanted to be a writer. There were no writing courses at that time. No creative writing courses. Um, I just sat down and wrote. And I wrote because I'd always written from when I was a wee kid, reading comics and trying to write comics and draw comics. I just always wanted to be. I, I didn't want to be a consumer. I want to be a creator. Uh, I I want to end with just taking you right back to the start of the chat when you were talking about how you don't know who your your murderer is. At what point does that become clear to you? 
Different points. Not always, you know, sometimes it's the next draft, it's the second draft before I find out who the killer is. Um, sometimes, usually halfway to two-thirds of the way through the first draft, I go, oh, hang on a minute. Um, I might have, an, I'm, right at the beginning, I might think, no, I think this is the killer. But I can change my mind, or they can change my mind, and I decide it's someone else, not them. Maybe it's too obvious. I think, oh, no, it's too obvious that it's them. Um, Do you find yourself writing shady characters into your story um, just to give yourself somewhere to go? No. No, I, I write shady characters into my stories because I like shady characters. They're much more fun to hang out with. You go to a pub, it's much more fun to hang out with the shady characters than it is the kind of law-abiding uh, <laughs> accountants and lawyers. Um, there's just not as many shady characters around as there used to be. But there's enough. If you look for them, they're still there. Uh but I'm not Rebus. I don't see the world through his eyes. I've always got to make sure that he, it, when I start writing a book, it's his voice and it's his way of looking at this world. You know, because Edinburgh is a beautiful city and he can't see it. So I've got to have other characters tell him that he's living in a beautiful city, um, a cultured city, as well as the city that he lives in, which is a kind of slightly more dangerous place. Because he can't see it anymore. He can't see it anymore. And, and like me, he takes his refuge in the Oxford Bar. And, and 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 that's where he's happiest. And you know what? It's where I'm happiest as well. So that is it for this week's Writer's Routine. Massive thanks to Ian Rankin for coming on the show. Uh, massive guest, one of the UK's be- best-selling crime authors uh, with a really exciting, interesting daily routine. Really bought into the spirit of the show as well. So thank you so much for that. His new book, In a House of Lies, is out right now. We've got all the links for it over on the website, writersroutine.com. And while you're on there, remember, it's probably the best place for you to get in touch with us. Uh, you can also give us a follow on Twitter if you want a quick retweet to any praise. You can find us on Instagram as well for daily show uh, motivational quotes and for updates and for clips from episodes as well to keep you going with your work Uh, and remember if you've got a spare second if you want to help out the show leave us a review on the itunes podcast store you can let other people know that you're enjoying writer's routine and next week on writer's routine we've got two authors who have worked together they're publishers as well so they know everything about the industry and they've written a book all about how the strongest women in history would solve everyday problems in the 21st century you can find out how they worked on that together next week with another episode of writer's routine i'll see you then bye